Well, that's great. <laughs> now I'm going to be, uh, I'm Dave Van Zandt, for those of you who don't know me, the president here at the New School, but I'm going to be very brief because there's a great deal of excitement in the hall. Can you hear him in the back? No. Oh, well, why don't how's you that? Say Is that better? Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, I know there's a great deal of excitement here, and one of the things I've learned in this job over the years is you just, at the new school, you just step back and let it all happen. So um, uh, tonight's conversation is a dialogue about critical thinking uh, in healing, and we have two great public figures with us tonight to do this. You know, it's really fitting for it to be here at the, at the, at the new school. You know, this is a place where criticism and critical thinking uh, are very important. Uh, and also critical thinking that's aimed at solving problems, at being creative and, and trying to solve some of the tremendous problems we have, uh, problems we have in our society. So uh, it's, great, uh, it's great to have these two individuals here. First, let me start with the First Lady, Shirley McRae. Um, you are a writer uh, and advocate all your life. You began your career in public service immediately after graduating from Wellesley College. You moved to New York City and joined the staff of the Commission for Human Rights, and now is First Lady of New York City. There, good. There's much more to clap about. That's just the start. So I think especially since you, uh, in this position, you've been especially a fierce advocate for high quality and accessible mental health services in the city. A leading voice uh, for early childhood development, and I think this year it's, it's very safe to say you were central to the administration's successful efforts to establish universal pre-kindergarten and after-school programs for all the middle school students. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. You've been, uh, you've been working to improve support for survivors of domestic violence. Um, and as chair of the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City, You've been working to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to services and resources they need. Uh, this brings leaders in the private and public sectors together to support the mayor's progressive agenda in areas of health, education, community empowerment, and social justice. Thank you for joining us tonight. And now our friend, our friend Bell Hooks, the scholar, uh, poet, author, and radical thinker. You've written dozens of books, we know, on, on all sorts of subjects such as gender, race, class, spirituality, teaching, media, contemporary culture, and the interconnectedness of, the, of these topics in relation to all systems of oppression. We are very fortunate to have you here for a few days. Uh, you've been a visitor here before, and you've really lightened up the entire place, so thank you for coming back. Um, you're, she's here as part of a residence at the Eugene Lang College. Uh, and so far, at least here, she's uh, been had these dialogues with people such as Laverne Cox, Cornell West, Gloria Steinem, uh, and Melissa Harris Perry. Uh, <laughs> now, if you can't tell, Belle, uh, you have been uh, one of our most popular uh, people on campus, and it's great to uh, it's great to have you uh, have you back uh, ha back here with us again. Um, now I know you have many fans, uh, but I was told by the by the first lady's staff um, before before we started this uh, that uh, when she was considering a conversation with you, um, she mentioned it to her children, uh, Dante and Chiara and they gave it an enthusiastic thumbs up. So this is why you're here, right? Good. Again, both of you, I know we're gonna have a tremendous dialogue. Um, thank you very much again for doing this. Thank you. Can I ask that the lights come up a bit? You know, like, we're not entertainers. You, you, you guys don't need to be sitting in the dark. Yeah, yeah, now I can see who we're talking to. You know, People wonder at times, like, who are these people Bell talks to at the New School and why? But I wanted especially to talk to Sherlane because like me, she takes healing seriously. And I wanted us to be able to talk about that in a public forum so that people can reflect more. You know, recently, everybody wants to know what I think about Baltimore. And I say to them, you know, while we know police brutality is a real issue, 
To me, the more relevant issue is where do black males go in this society? No matter their age. But for the most part, young black men go to the streets. And there are three things that await them in the streets. Police brutality and or drug stuff and or black on black male violence. So if we really want to do something about this issue, we have to talk about different places for black males of all ages to go, to be, to think. You know, years ago, I got so tired of hearing like, black boys need military academies. And I was like, hmm, why is it no one says black boys need Montessori schools to learn discipline, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and here's this woman who's raised an incredibly interesting and is raising him, young black male. Can you tell us some about that process, about how you perceive where black males can go and belong? Oh my goodness. You don't ask easy questions, do you? <laughs> And so, you know, I often say, Belle, it's, it's easier to grow a healthy child than to mend a broken adult. All right. All right? Mm -hmm. So we have a whole society of broken adults. And how do you find the answer to that? Clearly, there's no one solution, right? It started, because it all started so very long ago. And poverty and lack of education, all of those things are just so much a part part of the reason, um, in addition to racism, and, and you could just layer, right? <laughs> so where do they go to heal? I don't know, but I think we have to, whenever I think about trauma and stress and pain and all, I think about, well, we have to go to the root, right? All right. You find out what, what hurts most. What hurts most and how do you soothe it? How do you, because until you identify it, until you put a name to it, it's very hard to move forward. I mean, I'm, I was one of those broken people. Those of you who are Bell Hooks fans who've read my work know how much of my adolescent and young adulthood I spent being really suicidal, really feeling very depressed about life. And even though I began writing Ain't I a Woman, at 19, and Sherlane and I talked about how both of us kind of turned to writing as a space of healing, as a space of finding out who we were. You know, I had always thought of myself as a good writer, and then I went to Stanford, and all of a sudden I had these white male professors that were asking me, who wrote your papers? And I was like, what? You know, I wrote my papers, but can you imagine you know, here I was, this hit country girl, mm -hmm. taking the bus for the first time in my life, getting on an airplane for the first time in my life, going to this prestigious school, and being treated like I was an imposter, and what was I doing there, and how, how you know, think about all the things that break us, that broke something in me, because my parents didn't want me to go there. They were like, you need to take your butt to an HBC. I mean, this is something we're going to talk about. <laughs> Because on one hand, many of us black folks get the message that we are safer if we stay with other black people. That's bullshit. Yes. <laughs> I mean, exactly. That's exactly, I mean, I, I definitely think we have to support our HBCs. But one thing I knew as a little black nerd girl growing up in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, that people like me weren't safe at HBCs. I didn't have the right color, the right class background, and that I was, would be stomped on. But you know, I was stomped on at Stanford in a different way. But I also found those people at Stanford who valued my intellect and who helped me grow myself. Mm -hmm. And as I, I, I told Shirlane, my sister, who's a therapist, said to me, you know, well, well you know, how did you know to, to go to therapy? I said, girlfriend, I knew that it wasn't healthy to want to kill yourself every day. And I woke up every day of my life for many years with a feeling that I couldn't go on. And then when I got to college and therapy was free, I was like, okay, I'll go and talk to somebody. 
And I've been talking to people ever since. You know, I, I was telling Charlene that I just talked with a bunch of young black women who are graduating, and I told them, you know, if you had a heart attack, what would you do? Of course, they all think they'd call a doctor. I said, well, you know, when you're having an emotional heart attack, it's, it's important to look to somebody who can help you. It doesn't have to be a therapist, but you have to recognize that you need help. That's so true. That is so very true. It's the first step to healing, is reaching out, communicating with someone you trust, because you may not be able to get to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist may not be the right person. You may not be able to get to a therapist, but just reaching out to someone, that is, again, the first step to making yourself well, and it's so important. We're so tempted when we're in pain to curl up with it in, in our beds or in our corners and, and just sit with it, you know? And it, it, it doesn't get better that way. I mean, sometimes you have to do it. If something hits you really hard, you take your time and pull yourself together. But then you got, you, it's so important to reach out, talk to somebody. And let me tell you right now, God is not enough. Because <laughs> I came from, you know, the kind of Christian home, like when my brother was dealing with addiction and he was really struggling, mom and dad just wanted him to do it through the church. You know, just, just pray. And that, and that was like, I was like, yeah, we need to pray, but we also need to find the people who can help us. And one of the things, and, and this is what, what the New York City projects are so important, healing does not take place in isolation. You know, if I was charting my life every step of the way to this 62-year-old cute girl you see today, <laughs> um, I, each step of the way, there would be somebody that psychoanalyst Alice Miller calls an enlightened witness, somebody who helped me to see that I was more than my pain. You know, and, and that can be anybody. This is why, like, I mean, we have to take identity politics seriously, but sometimes we have to find that person, no matter who they are, that can help us. I come all the way to New York City to see a doctor, and he thinks that's insane, but it's because he's white, he's one of the few medical people I've seen who really cares about me being well. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I've seen a lot of people who just don't care about me being well. There are a lot of people who don't even think we black people can be well, that we are so broken. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it also says a lot when we are willing to take that extra step to seek out those people that have shown us that affection. I mean, my therapist helped me to see that you know you're sick when you're still hanging with the people that are treating you badly and making you feel bad That's and right. walking away from the people with whom you feel contentment and peace. That's right. That's right. First question you got to ask is, do you want to be well? Mm. Right? Is that what you really want? Because if you want to be well, you're going to get out there and talk, find the right person to help you along the way. And you never know what that person is going to look like. You just That's don't. Right? right? It's such an incredible balance, you know, because one of the things that Charlene has written about and talked about is that when she was a young feminist, you know, I, I think it's so interesting that everybody likes to talk about, yeah, Charlene was a lesbian back then, but, <laughs> the, but the vital thing about her was that she was committed to feminist thinking and feminist practice. And that is something that she is still committed to in all her years on this planet. And it's much more important than what she does with her body and with whom. Because you know what? I hate to tell you gay people, but while gayness is despised, feminism is really despised. <laughs> it's like people want to blame everything bad that's happening in our culture around gender on feminism. But, but one of the things that Charlene has said is that Every woman should be free to choose her own priorities and pursue them. And that's on all levels of our lives. Who, who we party with, who we dream with, who we heal with. And, and those are major decisions, I think, for young females, especially heteronormative females, because I think many young females still look to the relationship to be the space where they will be rescued. Oh, I said that. <laughs> I mean, I believe it, but I didn't say that. 
Uh, it's important. I think it takes a long time to define yourself, though, don't you, Belle? Are you kidding? I was 35 before I woke up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I After feel like I'm still finding myself. Um, it's, it's, it really is an evolution. And you're not, you don't wake up when you're 18 or 35 or even 50 and like, oh, this is it. Right? It's a process. But I think, Charlene, that you got to get the core. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really into houses. You know, passions in my life used to be shoes, but it's houses and cars. And one thing about a house um, is that you got to have a good foundation. Yes. And people of color, many of us are coming from dysfunction, and we don't have a good foundation. We're going to talk about that. Many of us are coming from abandonment, abuse, and other forms of trauma. So, I mean, we've even seen it. You know, we saw it with uh, President Clinton and Jesse Jackson, that these people can come to enormous prestige and power and still be, I hate to say it, enormously fucked up in their emotional lives and do really, really unliberating things. And we have got to be able to face that. I want to especially give a shout out to, to three books that are coming out. Kevin Powell's new memoir. Of course, the name of it is escaping me. Google it. <laughs> OK, that's really bad. Kevin Powell. And Charles Blow's The Fire Shut Up Within Me. Yes. And Marvin Gaye's last wife, Jan, has written a book called After the Dance. And all three of these memoirs really courageously, honestly, provocatively look at trauma in the lives of young black males, and how there's nothing in this culture that prepares them to find that space of healing. And that a lot of times, there's the constant acting out, and the constant acting out on, of violence um, as a way of letting out the rage, the, the powerlessness. Um, I was just awed by Kevin Powell's story and his, um, you know, real anger as a child, because we don't want to deal with the fact that children see the racial injustice, the sexism, the class stuff. I mean, the work on poverty in his memoir and growing up poor and its impact on his psyche and his sense of possibility. We don't hear enough about those things from young black males or young black females. I was just telling Sherlane that her daughter, Kiara, needs to start writing her book. She gave me a piece of writing that's just clear. It's never too early. Ain't I a woman? Bell Hooks, 19 years old. Because I was searching. I was looking in the mirror and thinking, mm, these white women are talking about how they don't have to go to work and they haven't found themselves. And I have to tell you, I had never known a black female that didn't go to work. <laughs> so I was like, oh, they're talking about a very different reality. And, you know, black women I knew went to work, but they weren't liberated. Work didn't liberate them. Work was often a different kind of slavery. The Education of Kevin Powell, A Boy's Journey into Manhood. All right. All right, thank you. So, I mean, I am so excited that black males are opening their hearts, claiming the space of vulnerability. I can't imagine, in terms of patriarchy and maleness, the struggle, because part of what feminism, I mean, we are products of what feminism made possible, for us to find our voice, for us to speak openly about our traumas. For males in general in our society, we're still waiting for that revolution. That's right. That's right. I have no answers. Really. I think it's, it, you know, they got to do it. Don't you think? We can help, but. Well, I think, though, you know, you know from this good looking, smart guy that I'm sitting in front of, yeah. that part of the answer mm -hmm. is, you know, critical thinking and critical self reflection. I mean, critical thinking is just like answering the question who, what, when, where, why? a lot of times. You know, and I can remember Cornell and I, we've been buddies for so long, and we used to go to this black juke joint in New Haven and drink and dance, and I would be bemoaning how I was looking for a man, and Cornell said, you know, 
Uh, black men don't want to be existentially self-reflective, Bill. <laughs> And, and I was like, okay, is that, is that, is that like saying I'm never gonna have a brother? You know? But I think that one of the things about Dante in his working on his self-actualization is the complete embracing of critical thinking. Mm. I mean, the first thing I heard about Dante, he's a high school student. He reading his bell hooks. I mean, how many adult men in this audience can say that? That they Raise have your hand. Oh. <laughs> okay, you got a But it's, it's, it's some, but I mean, okay. high school, come on. Yeah. So I think that what we know, I know reading saved me. That if it weren't for reading and really finding out through books that there was a different way to think and be, I wouldn't be here. Reading and writing. I wouldn't be here either, because I didn't have anybody to talk to. And I didn't even know how to talk, really. I had no idea how to connect to my feelings and express what was going on with me. I'm so completely used to being invisible in a certain way that the books were like, I, I could talk to those characters. And they talk back to me, and I could figure out things through the readings. It's, it's so a whole world So can you tell us there. more about your process? I mean, we sit here seeing you looking so awesome and being so articulate. <laughs> when, <laughs> when did that process of morphing into who you are begin? Oh, goodness. The big questions. When did it begin? I don't know. It began at the beginning. I grew up loving books, loving reading. Um, I, I grew up in a very kind of hostile environment in terms of... Kind of, huh? Yeah, kind of, kind of. It know, was to, hostile. To be the only... <laughs> well, I had, I had different lives. I mean, that the, was the beginning of the different identities, right? Because I had my family. I had, we had church. We had, you know, after school, Y World, Girls Club. And then there was school. So I often says I was... I had the white world by day, I had the mixed world after school, and then I was black in the evenings and on weekends. <laughs> and reading was my solace. Reading was my therapy. Reading was what But you gotta kept tell us whole. more about how you put those pieces together so that the fragmentation you're describing, mm -hmm. which I ain't gonna talk about Sherlane, but you know, fragmentation is very key to mental illness. I mean, many of us disassociate because we have been in such fragmented senses of identity. So we want to hear more about how this woman said, okay, I'm putting all those pieces together and I'm emerging as a whole self. Well, I'm still emerging. I'm still putting them together. And, and I don't know, part of, of being in New York is you don't have to put them all together. You can be in different communities, and people love that part of you that they see and feel and touch, and, and that's okay. Um, I think the problem is if you can't inside feel whole. I feel very whole inside, and I think that's because I have people in my life who accept me for all, all those pieces that I am. You know, I have a partner who accepts all of me, but they are, you know, that was a process that didn't happen overnight. And I'm, I'm, I'm 60 years old. <laughs> and those pieces really just started coming together as I became a public figure because then there was no place to go. <laughs> well, I, th I think that... Why are you laughing? <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's the first thing I told her when we met. You're so young and cute. Because <laughs> we're going to talk about that in terms of talking about self-esteem. But I just want to say, you know, she's jumping a little bit into the big deep stuff, which is, I mean, basically what Charlene, I'm, I'm her interpreter, said is that... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> as I begin to love mm -hmm. myself and to be loved by others, the, the foundation, the foundation of that house that I was talking about began to come together. And that was true of my life too. And I was basically in my mid-30s before I began to realize how messed up I really was, you know? 
how much I didn't understand what it meant to love. You know, I was in the relationship with the younger guy, and, you know, he, we didn't have the same understanding of love. And, you know, that was when Miss Bell, like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to put it on a note card, what love is. Love is six things, a combination of care, commitment, responsibility, respect, and trust. Mm -hmm. And I told him, you know, if you're having trouble figuring out if what the loving thing to do is, just pull out your note card. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, a five-year-old can pull out this note card and begin to process. Uh, naturally, we broke up. But <laughs> my point is that part of what happened for Sherlane was that process of loving of those six things that come together and make it possible for us to heal. And many of us, I mean, I still don't feel like I've had love like that in partnership. I have it in friendships. And certainly with all of you who read my work and share with me how it heals and changes your life. But I think that the effort to heal mm -hmm. um, continues um, but I did hear in you that as you moved towards embracing love, because see, love can come to us, and we can push it away. That's right. That's and it, right. But as we embrace it, it can give us the foundation to heal. It can give us the foundation to tell our stories and to share those stories without falling apart. Or if we fall apart, um, as I often write about my grandfather, that he, he took the broken bits and pieces of myself and helped me put them together again. So that that is part of what, I mean, I think that we as African Americans, especially, and other people of color, that mental health has to be our revolutionary frontier. Because if we get out into the world trying to lead protests and be revolutionary, but we're messed up, we end up with dysfunctional revolutions. You know, we end up with the mom beating her son on the street and everybody acting like, isn't that grand? You know? Oh, this, this is a loving black mother. She's going to beat her son before the white folks do. And that's going to keep him safe. And I said, you know what? Our prisons are full of black men that have been beaten in their childhoods. So if it was beating them, that would keep them from being critically conscious, from protesting. The question isn't protesting, it's how are we protesting? And what are we protesting for? But isn't it disturbing that people like to see black males being hit and beaten and consider that progress? We have a lot of dysfunction in our, in our lives, a whole lot of dysfunction. Which is why the healing question and the mental health question is so crucial. But, Shirley, why is it so hard for us to face it? Oh. What do you think? Well, first of all, the dysfunction, the, the mental challenges we face is so pervasive. It's so pervasive that we don't even recognize it as being something that's out of place, out of whack. We, I think that we've come to accept it as like, oh, well, some people wear green clothing, you know? Like, yeah, that's fine. It's, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just, it blends in with everything. I mean, the statistics I've heard, one in four, one in five faces, has a diagnosable mental health challenge. That's, that's like, look at this front row. That, that's a lot of people. And we don't have the language, we don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. And we don't even have, have not had the will. We do okay, now have the science deep. and the research, but now we've got to find a way to put it into words and move forward. Well, let me say that no matter how many books I've written, no matter how many people whose lives those books have touched, I can talk to one of my family members and they'll say, maybe you wouldn't be so fucked up if you, if you would just stop talking about your childhood. Ah. You know? Um, so let's remember like how much as black people, people of color, we really push repression. Yes. So that, like, I, like when my partner, when I was a young woman and my partner was being violent and I tried to talk to my mom about it, her whole thing was, well, what did you do? Uh -huh. You know? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're lucky to have him. And I realized, of course, 
in my process of growth that he was doing the same thing to me that mom and dad had done to me, mm -hmm. shaming me and abusing me. And I think that... It was familiar. It was comfortable, exactly. right? Exactly. Like, you know, when I would I go know to, how to do this. Go to therapy and I would mm -hmm. tell my therapist, she, was, she would cry. She would say, I can't believe somebody would say that to you. But it was like stuff that went on in my house every single day towards somebody. Right. And I think about it now when I meet young black mothers and fathers who tell a child, you're the stupidest person I know. You're so stupid. And can you imagine the impact on a child on hearing that day in, day out, prolonged lengths of time? When you read Jan Gay's memoir of Marvin Gay, and you find, you know, when he was so sexually molested by a relative, the father, he tries to tell his dad, his dad says, you've got demons. You know, those are demons. And, you know, and throughout his life, as you see him falling apart emotionally every step of the way, he had this belief that he was evil, that he had demons. And come on, church black people, you know how quickly we'll be told that you're evil. And the blacker you are, the more likely you are to be told that you're evil. I find, Shirlane, and you mentioned this in some of your writing and thinking, black people in this country don't want to admit that dark-skinned black people suffer a very different kind of racism. You know, they don't get in the taxi cabs like Belle and they say, what country are you from? <laughs> you know, because no matter how smart you sound as a dark-skinned black person, you are under suspicion and white supremacy is always out there to tell you that you are less than. You are not as beautiful. You're not as capable. You're not going to go far, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't want to acknowledge those color caste differences among ourselves. I mean, Lorraine Hansberry, who's one of my big mentor figures, said, you know, this kind of thinking among our children is, is, is the only thing that should shame us. I mean, can you really believe that we're in a culture that our children are still grappling with, can I love myself the color that I am? I mean, how sad and deep is that? Very sad. Very, very sad. And I look at you and see how beautiful you are. And, and I think, what was it like to be growing up as a teenager feeling like, okay, I'm dark skinned and I don't have the straight hair, so I'll never I didn't be- I have any hair. <laughs> My hair was that grow. Too. My hair was so. I didn't have the right nose. My lips were too big. I was ugly. I really believed I was ugly. You yeah. Well, but, but where mm -hmm. did that come from? That belief you were ugly. The world around me, and 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 I'm sad to say, nobody in my family really told me I looked good either. So <laughs> it kind of get got reinforced. Whereas I got, mm -hmm. you're crazy. And you're, gonna, <laughs> you're crazy because of not thinking the way people did, so that you, I mean, Shirlene has written about that feeling of being an outsider. I mean, in a direct quote from her is, I never had a sense of belonging. And I never had that either in my childhood. I always thought, I am so different, and they, and they know it. That's why they're saying I'm insane and I'm crazy. And I think that certainly, too, as poor and working class African Americans and so on, Many of us, whenever we were different, that was the beginning of shaming and abandonment. And, you know, I could be whipped when all other six of my siblings were being cared for because I was different. I even talked different, mm -hmm. you know. And all of those things that linger in our lives. And, you know, there I was. Then I was going to go to college and be told, oh, you're difficult. Then I was going to be able to look for a job and be told, you're difficult, you know? And it's like, the great thing about growth and health and healing is you learn how crazy the people are that are telling you this stuff. <laughs> you know, you, you learn to deconstruct it. And you learn that when, what they're really saying when they're telling you that you're difficult is that we don't want you to be a free black woman who loves herself or a free black man who loves himself. You're outside the box, and that makes you a threat. If you're colonized, you're not a threat, because you're going to always be a victim. Even if you succeed, you're going to undermine yourself in some way. I want you to talk more about th these. 
You're she so interesting. <laughs> I know, that was shocking for me when I was talking to a friend about how lonely I was, and she was like, Belle, you're one of the most interesting people you're ever going to meet. Get up for yourself. <laughs> and, Don't you think? And right? that, that was hard. But that goes uh -huh. back to self-esteem, and mm -hmm. it was hard for me to embrace that valuation of myself mm -hmm. because I was always made to feel that, you know, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was what my family would say. I went on a date with a white man my freshman year in college, and um, a bunch of black men pulled me off the street and said, nigga girl, who do you think you are? Mm. And it seems that that question haunted me in my dysfunctional mm. lack of mental health years, that inability to, to name who you are. Right. So that I think part of the process of healing is beginning to see who you are, to be able to see myself as a writer, mm -hmm. as a thinker, and to validate that. But I think Charlene is right when she says it's a constant struggle. It's like AA and all the other addiction the models the that you're always, you can mm -hmm. always be triggered. Some of you know that I recently, on April 13th, opened up the Bell Hooks Institute. Um, thank you. And part of what it does, it houses my African-American art collection, contemporary African-American art, my archives, artifacts from my childhood. But I was really stunned when I told other black women, thinkers, writers, academics, that I was going to do this institute. The first thing they said was, Belle, you don't know what you're doing. You, you, you have no idea. You're just going to make a mess of it. And I felt, you know, you get triggered. I felt again that, right. well, maybe they're right, and I don't know what I'm doing. And then I had to face that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but this is the great thing about healing. I thought, if I don't know what I'm doing, I know who to go to, to learn what it is I need to do. I know who to shout out to, to get the help that I need. And that help does not come from the naysayers. That's it right. It comes from the people who have the trust That's that right. you've gotten this far and you can bring yourself through. I asked Charlene earlier about spirituality because spirituality has been one of the aspects of my life that has helped me build that different foundation and that I didn't really talk about so much in my younger years because, you know, I was cool. I wanted to be cool more than I wanted to be spiritual. You know, when I was down with the atheists and the agnostic people, I didn't want to tell them that I went to church every Sunday. <laughs> and then when my mother called me once to say, you know, someone called here and they said that you're a Buddhist. I said, oh, mom, I read my Bible every day. I chant. And yes, I write for those Buddhist magazines. And she said, well, that's good to know because Buddhism is Satanism. I mean, here's a country black woman that didn't know anything about Buddhism, but she can condemn it to Satanism. And I think that that kind of struggle against ignorance is part of what we have to put the wall up against to heal Absolutely. and to go forward. Absolutely. And you know Education what? is a huge part of this. We, as I said, we don't have the language. We don't have the vocabulary. We have to learn like, what it is that's, what is hurting us. How do we, what do we call that? What does it mean? How do we, how do we um, sort, sort it out? Because we're, we're in so much stress from day to day. I mean, there, there are no words really for what we're going through. We, I, I heard this, uh, what was the, the, the latest, toxic stress. What is toxic stress, right? I, could, I think it's something akin to torture. It's when, you know, every day, it's not always like, bam, bam, right? It's, it's, it's the job. It's what we experience as black people right. in this culture often. The, the discrimination that's every day, but it's pounding away at you, right? Like in an intense way. That's toxic stress. That's very hard to recover from, very hard. How do, you, how do you heal when you're in an environment, when you're getting that kind of abuse? Well, I think it's also interesting that when you grow up and are self-loving, and like when I tell my white colleagues, because I work at a predominantly white college, that I'm not coming out to their whatever, because I can't put myself through that today. <laughs> um, that, um, you know how, when, when, when you feel like, I can't be the only today. Yes. I 
can't answer your question. Do you, do you guys know that video where Queen Latifah is talking about Excedrin for uh, uh, relief? Um, I mean, I, from racial harassment, I think. I think that as we grow as a collective people committed to healing, we will not be ashamed to name what we need to take care of ourselves. Because I know how disappointed my colleagues often are because I don't participate, but I also know how ignorant they are of how much their comments cause suffering. You know, those little everyday racisms that people take for granted that cause us so much pain. And we don't want to stop and explain and be told, oh, Bill, do you really think it was about race? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how many of us hear that again and again and again? And among my young colleagues who are really suffering from mental health problems, they feel particularly vulnerable because they've grown up in an environment that says racism is over. I mean, for, for Char Charlene and I to get to where we got, we had to face racism. We could not pretend it's over. No. And young people today, especially, the world is wanting them to pretend it's over. Your, your father's the mayor. Your mother's a professor. Why should you feel any pain? And I think that it's become very hard for young black people to articulate the daily life pain. And I guess, you know, my colleague and I, us old girls, we get together and we say, well, what's wrong with the young people? Why do they think they can trust these white folks and then they come crying to us that, you know, they got stepped on. And because they don't, they've been taught racism is not real. And so then when they come up against it. They don't know what racism it, is. Yeah. Come on. Exactly. I, don't know that, I don't think that they don't think it's not real. I think they understand discrimination is real. But I don't think they really know what racism is. Who teaches what racism is? They don't teach it in, you know, it's not in the curriculum necessarily. <laughs> but it's, they don't think of it as a, a, systemic, a systemic oppression. They think of, you know, white people have kind of taken over the language. <laughs> oh, as, yeah. As oh, happens, yeah. Right? Talk and, about it. And, <laughs> and which is, you know, part of the problem with labels. You know, it becomes this kind of one off, throwaway thing. And they mm. do not understand the history because they, they just got here, right? And not studying it in the same way as we experienced it. So we have, it's, it's education. We, gotta, we really have to explain over and over and over again. We can't e expect that, oh, well, we lived through it and it happened, and they know. They don't. That's why Selma, which I thought was a very flawed, made-for-TV kind of movie, but it had such an impact on the young people that I teach. Because, like some people say, well, what is Selma? Right. Like those people that said, when I was coming to their school, is Bell Hooks a person? I mean, this is what ignorance creates. So for a lot of black folk and people of color and white folks who care, just seeing the small footage of the real black people in Selma was life changing. You know, just seeing what those black women endured being beaten and because they believed in freedom and justice. And I was telling Charlene, I asked my students, what are you willing to get out in the streets for? What are you willing to put your life on the line for? And they can't answer. Because they don't, they don't believe, for one thing, that change is possible. Right. That's and sad. That's that actually is kind of unbelievable, sad, right? isn't it? No, because to me, that's part of the healing, is you have to know, what is it you would give your life for? If you can't answer that question, then something is missing from your life. Truly, right? don't you think? Absolutely. It's, you have to know what it is that matters more than yourself. That was exactly the word I was going to use, Shirlane, that you have to know what matters. Mm -hmm. I don't like the phrase, black lives matter, because I feel like who thinks black lives doesn't matter but other people? I mean, it's a kind of reactionary. I, I'm not into reactionary stuff. I'm like, let's create revolutionary thinking. Let's revise. 
Let's change how we are. In, in my last book, Writing Beyond Race, I tried to, to formulate theoretically, where do I feel safe as a black person? And as those of you who've read the book know, I wrote a lot about home and how I feel safe in my home. But you know, I can tell you, I don't watch TV in my home. I catch TV in restaurants, at friends' houses, because you know, TV is against us, okay? Uh, and if you think that you can be a little child of any race and watch TV every single day for hours at a time and have healthy self-esteem, you're kidding yourself. Oh, no. I mean, it, it so won't true. let you. No, that is so true. I can't, I mean, and movies, I, I mean, the stuff, as a woman, just, just take the right. gender, right? Yeah. We're always getting killed and raped and put in cubicles and it's, it's not healthy to watch that stuff. <laughs> I know, I mean, people were mad at me because I critiqued uh, 12 Years a Slave and I said, you know, if I don't see another black woman naked, raped and beaten as long as I live, I will be just fine mm -hmm. because I want to see something else. I want to see a dull black woman like myself um, <laughs> sitting down year after year. And not the help. <laughs> writing books that may or may not make any money and feeling an incredible sense of spiritual and sexual ecstasy. Um, you know. You know, yes. I mean, yes. I was recently. Uh, I You're going to have to write that show. <laughs> I had these, um, a sister institute, women's institute in De Pere, Wisconsin, that I partnered with because they brought me there. And I saw these are people doing what I want to do. And I can tell you this, one way to heal is when you see people doing what you want to do and doing it well, they're good people to learn from. But anyhow, they brought me to De Pere, Wisconsin, to St. Norbert's, which is so white it ain't funny. Um, but they did a thing in their women's center where they invited 100 children from the Oneida and the Menominee reservations from the spaces where black people live, which have to be searched for. Um, and you know, they got Bell Hooks books, the children's books for them to read. And you know, and there I am being interrogated excessively by the six to 10 or, or whatever. But what made you think of that? And why did you write that? And I was just so awed because I thought when I was in high school, I had the white teachers telling me we didn't read books by black people because they hadn't written anything. And then when I had some examples, we don't read black people because it's bad. And I thought about these hundred children getting their bell hooks books signed, being mm -hmm. able to interrogate me and ask me questions. Mm -hmm. And I mean, one of the things that Sherlane says again and again is representations matter. And I think about who will those children be? What will the difference be for them? that they're already seeing a black woman writer. She's already talking to them about critical thinking and listening to them and answering their questions. That's how we make a different world. Amen. That's the revolution. Amen. Yes, it is. Not being in the streets. Mm -hmm. um, because the streets will never be kind to us in this imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. It's big sister. You know, right. we have to create the spaces of loving kindness. You're talking about prevention again. You're talking about going, yes, you know, yes. they got, you got to grow them that way. Exactly. Yeah, so. We got to both grow and we've also got, I mean, my fantasy, I used to say I wish that we could take all the movie theaters that are closed in our little towns in this nation and make them places within the Palo Freire tradition where black males especially could be educated for critical consciousness. Because remember that a lot of us, because I live in Appalachia. Illiteracy is a serious problem. A lot of black males outside the hip, cool places to live don't have reading beyond a second and third grade level. Why aren't we opening these theaters, teaching people by watching movies? I mean, one of the things that helped me develop myself as an 
intellectual who, I mean, part of what I love about me and Cornell, we can talk to anybody. We can go to any street corner. We don't have like, oh, we got PhDs and we write books. But part of that is I found that no matter how much education people had, if you talk to them about a movie they saw, and you say, well, what do you think about that movie? Or you know how we you go to the movie with all the black people? We telling you what we think. <laughs> Uh-huh, I knew she didn't need to go to bed with him because he is blah, blah, blah. And I realized that critical thinking is not about how much education you have. Because children are some of the world's great critical thinkers. Yes. It's whether you use critical thinking. And we don't expect black men to use critical thinking. We don't expect black men of any ages to use critical thinking. And so I kept thinking, what if we just had a whole campaign in our nation? You know, not for jobs. OK, I'm going to be cold. If you give fucked up people jobs, it doesn't mean that they're going to succeed. Because as I did in my own life, when you fuck up, you, when you're fucked up, you will fuck up. It's no matter how much money. Uh, I'm going to quote you on that one. You know, uh, I have to just say that, especially for the ladies out there, I'm really into us getting our money straight. But one of the things I learned early on about money is that if you can't manage 5000 you won't manage 50000 That you have to start at the root, back to, to your, where, where are the roots? And how do we start there? Mm -hmm. How do we cleanse? How do we go there? Right. And for, for many of us, you know, certainly Buddhism and other forms of spiritual practice. Um, I mean, Buddhism is exciting to me because it emphasizes actions. You know, like I wake up and I say, okay, Belle, what you gonna do today? You know, to spread peace and the revolution. Because of course you know that I'm gonna spend the 18 years of my life that I hope I have left healthy and whole preaching the importance of love as that transformative factor in healing. As soon as I came to that, I wrote all about love. And among That's a beautiful book. And yeah. all of all the Bell Hooks books, that is the one people cross race, class, sexual practice will come up and say, this book really changed my life. Because learning to really love changed my life. And you know, I do these workshops with men and women. You go into the man workshop, no matter what their sexual practice is, and you say, well, are you thinking about love? What's on your mind? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you go into the women's workshop, and you open up the topic of love, and it's like you can't get everybody to stop talking. And so to me, this is part of our gender crisis. And I was telling Charlene, I have been rereading Dorothy Dinnerstein's The Mermaid and the Minotaur, which came out in 1997. And one of the things she says in this book is that until men participate equally in parenting, we will never be able to fully challenge patriarchy. And I was both sad, because I thought, here we are in 2015, and we are still struggling to get people to see that fathers matter and that the parenting as fathers matter. You know, so much of the pain and anguish I see in young women, and particularly young black women and women of color, is fatherless daughters, you know, where the predator, oppressive man comes along and offers that tidbit of care and love and attention that you've never had from the longing father need in yourself. And how these men, I mean, they know how to work it. They know how to tell you exactly what it is your little heart has been longing to hear. And that's how many of us get hurt and get hurt beyond what we can heal by ourselves. And so I think it's really deep for us to think about what is the role we expect men to play in parenting. And p being a father doesn't mean that you go to work and you bring home the money. Being a father is about how you talk to your child. I mean, about a, a few years ago when I was teaching at Yale, I asked my students, how many times do you see a black man and a black woman talking together? None of us raised our hands. So that was actually when Cornell and I began to work together and to do Breaking Bread, because we realized that, you know, my parents would talk at one another. Dad would say, uh, tell your mother. 
you know. <laughs> and mom would say, tell your father. Mm. And, you know, you think, these two people are sitting in the same room. Right. But so that's what, normal. That, go, that becomes normal, right? That's, and so how do we heal from that? If we don't have examples, what we cannot imagine cannot come into being. And that's part of my joy in being here with Shirlane, because it, as we imagine healing, as we put it on the table, as we ask ourselves, what does healing look like? I think we can begin the work, but we've got to put it on the table. Absolutely. And that's part of the work you've been doing. And this quiet, shy woman, well, she used to be quiet. She's got to catch up with herself because herself has changed. Herself has come out of the quiet closet and has lots to share and to teach. Um, and it's going to be an exciting process for New York City to see you unfold in this way and to share your wisdom, of which there is so much there, her writing. I was telling her, I was like, well, do you know so-and-so? Because she was telling me that she's hoping to get your book. And so already life has these growth plans in store for her. And that's amazing. I mean, I actually was amazed today thinking about you and I and how we both, in many ways, were these solitary young black women who feminism came into our lives and new sexualities. And we begin to, to blossom ourselves. And I thought about the fact that we have the great fortune to be able to use our voices on behalf of others who don't have possibilities on behalf of the healing that is about telling our stories. So that I think that that's an amazing movement because we sometimes forget when all the bad things are happening that miracles are also happening. Marvelous things are also happening. I am so, was so excited when she agreed to talk to me. You know, not everybody wants to talk to Bill. <laughs> I can't imagine why. Oh. <laughs> Some people are afraid. <laughs> and it, but think about that. Why should we be afraid? If I ask Shirlane something she doesn't want to answer, she's a big girl. She can say, you know, Belle, I don't want to answer that. Because I'm right. sure going to say that if you ask me something I don't want to answer. <laughs> I think it's time for us to open up and for Belle to do what she does. It, you can ask a question, your name, your question, but if you are going on too long with loving kindness, I will stop you. And I want you all to remember that the two people up here are Shirlane McRae and Belle Hooks. <laughs> and that your questions should be directed to us and the subject of our conversation. Your name? <laughs> My name is Phaedra. Um, this question uh, has a lot of different layers to it. But it's Make not gonna it be short. Long. It won't be long. <laughs> It'll be short but thorough. Um, it's around the idea of the personal and the activist in us and in terms of assumptions that are made about people based on what they look like. And what I'm curious to hear the role you think it takes um, in terms of our personal stories, those, those things that people don't know about us, and the idea of responsibility in terms of taking that personal and bringing it out. And then you just mentioned a moment ago, it was okay. perfect, that idea of like, we got what you. you. Just mentioned, yeah. Shirlane, you want to? I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a first take on okay. that. I mean, I think that we, as, you know, we are human, so we come with some instincts and um, ways of being in the world that are not necessarily good. And I think it's our personal, we have, it's our personal responsibility to respect other people and to help other people respect us, no matter what we look like, because this is just. Right? Skin, hair, um, nobody knows what's inside. Nobody out there knows what's going, what's going through me right now, the feelings I'm feeling or what I bring to this stage, not really. Uh, so, but how you manifest yourself to the world also matters too, like how you present yourself. It's, um, it's, it's a two-way thing. Well, you, can't, you don't have control over how people see you, but you do have control over how you put yourself out there. And if you use confessional narratives, 
you have to decide what you want the impact of those narratives to be. I mean, because um, I think when I was younger and writing, I didn't realize that when you write something in a book, mm -hmm. it's there. <laughs> and that people are going to be judging you. I mean, I went on some date a few years ago in New York City with a black writer. And he said to me, I was wearing pink. And he was like, well, what are you doing wearing pink? I thought you didn't like the color pink. And I was like, what are you talking about? But he had read that in a Bell Hooks book, <laughs> you know? And it was one of those moments where you realize that when we are sharing a story, we have to think about the consequences of what it means to share that story. That's why I'm so impressed by Kevin Powell and Charles Blow, because they are sharing stuff you know, I still haven't interrogated Charles enough to say, how did his teenage son feel about the narrative that he shared? Mm. Um, which is just so f vulnerable and, you know, and so your name, I'm going on too long. Hi, I'm Melanie. I work for a College and Community Fellowship, which is a nonprofit dedicated to helping formerly incarcerated women earn their college degrees. So you guys have touched on an, a bunch of issues here that are very near to my heart, the, the relationships between education and mental health and also the criminal justice system. And also you said it's um, e easier to raise Question. a healthy child. It's coming, I promise. Our, the people that come to us can come to us broken, but with the support that we build, we can help them give and receive love and give and receive support. And my question for you is, with such a large part of our population suffering from mental health issues um, in the prison system, how can we begin to build the community and the support systems for these people as they come out? How do we build that community and make sure that we are mending people who have been broken? Good question. That's what we're working on right now. I mean, there's so many wounded, wounded souls out there that it is absolutely daunting. I think that's why we need the safety net. That's why we need um, supportive housing for people who will never be able to support themselves in a traditional kind of job. That's why we need all of the services that government has traditionally provided, and then more. We need a different kind of mental health system. We've always had, you know, two different health systems, right? That we, I call it the tail two health systems. <laughs> one for mental health and one for physical health. The one for mental health is broken. Um, I think that if we put that back together again or, or create it anew so that we have different kinds of people to provide services, community health workers, um, train clergy, train the community leaders we already have, because we're not going to grow a crop of psychiatrists. It's not going to happen, nor is it necessarily appropriate. Then we can help bring about the kind of healing we need. Peer counseling, very successful, evidence-based peer counseling. There, there is a way that we can do this. We have to do it. We're never going to survive as a, as a city, as a society, if we don't. So I think that's what we have to do. We have to look forward. What we have is not working. So let's, let's fix it, let's br bring it anew. But, and let's also though remember that there are men who are coming into their decolonized mind in prison. Let's remember that that's where Malcolm X came into his mm -hmm. decolonized identity. So that we don't, you know, because what we, again, what we imagine, if we only imagine prison as this life destroying institution, we won't respect those men and women imprisoned, who are learning, who are growing. You know, the men who write to me and say, I've made your name a household word around this prison <laughs> because we have such discussions. And I just want to put that out there because there's a lot of attack on reading in prison and access to libraries. So that part of our activism can be to support there being that space of books and learning and education. Because if we look at the men who, you know, I always say to people, most black men in our society get no quiet time. And for a lot of black men, prison is the only time that they get to have silence and solitude and that time Cornell talks about to be existentially self-reflective <laughs> because they don't have a choice about movement. So I think of J. Jarvis Masters, a, young, a black man who's been in prison since he was 18. I encourage you to read him and how he has grown 
and how he has come into his own spiritually um, while he, he will be incarcerated probably for the rest of his life. Your name? My name is Alia. I, I just want to read back something to you because you said it and we heard it, which was really entertaining and beautiful to hear. I want to see a dull black woman like myself sitting down year after year, writing books, not making money, feeling an incredible sense of spiritual and sexual ecstasy. And I just want to thank you for that line and make sure that you heard it the same way that we did. Um, <laughs> And, and I don't think the mayor had joined us yet, so just for your pleasure as well. Uh, but in, in, in more seriousness, um, you said, you both asked the question, what are you willing to put yourself on the line for and give up your life for? And if I may, I'd like to ask that question to you, if you'd share with the audience. Well, you already took up too much time. And <laughs> right at this moment, we're not going to answer that question because we, we're not going to take any new people in line, but we want to give the people in line. And if we have time, because we're going to say a few words before we end, We'll come back to that. Because I, I already told Charlene I wasn't going to tell people what my issue is. Your name. Hi, my name is Talani. And um, how do you encourage people of color to become psychiatrists and psychologists and things? Because we are a small percentage in the uh, mental health field. In the first well, place. I like to think of how do we encourage people to become healers? Because, you know, talking about people going through the, the white dominated, remember now, the vast majority of black doctors, we're talking medical doctors in our society, are still primarily educated at HBCs wow. because they are so mistrusted in the white medical establishment. So I think that we have to go back, black people, to forms of healing that were very much a part of our lives from slavery to the present day. Like, for example, growing up in Hicksville, we had black women who interpreted dreams. They hadn't read Freud. They hadn't read their Jung, but you could go over to their house and tell them your dream, and they would talk about what it means. I mean, think about that, black folks, that we valued our dreams enough to believe that they might be guides. We didn't have to buy Brene Brown or any of the other self-help people. So to me, I say, what are we doing to heal? and to become healers. And if a part of that is going into a Western institution and becoming a therapist, more power to you or a psychiatrist. But remember that healing, Pima Children says, start where you are. Healing, I have, I'll tell you this little joke, even though I'm talking too much. I decided that I really wanted out of academe. So I'm going to be a healer. I'm gonna start my little business, which I call Spirit Talk. And I, you know, you, when you live in a small town, you just have to tell one person and the whole town finds out. So you can come and talk to me uh, for $20 and I will help you solve your problem. We, we will work on this together. Well, what I found is the people came, I helped them solve their problems, but they didn't want to pay me the $20. <laughs> even if they had jobs, even, I mean, it was a curious phenomenon for me and I still haven't worked it through, other than to, to be thankful that I didn't need the $20 to live. Your name? Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait, wait. Um, talk therapy. So we can all be healers. All right. Right, because we all, all, right. we all have something to give, whether it's to friends, family, whatever. We, we, we can be healers ourselves for the people who are close to us. And before we had psychiatrists and all of that, we had our traditional healing, but talk therapy, which is so popular now and so effective, was part of that. So remember, Good you don't point. always, you know, we need, I think we need, we need our psychiatrists, we need our psychologists, we need all social workers. Please, I encourage people to go out and get in those professions. We need them in a way we didn't need them before, but that does not mean you can't be a healer if you don't go in that direction. Absolutely. Your name? My name is Elaine Terrace, and it is an honor at my advanced age to finally hear you speak in person. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> and in case you think I'm kidding, I'm 78 years old. God bless you. Okay. Now, speaking of God, <laughs> um, <laughs> you kind of, you mentioned spirituality several times kind of skirted around the issue of religion. Surely spirituality and religion are not identical things. I need not tell you that. 
Question. I believe, yes. I be, uh, uh, yeah, there's going to, uh, it's very short. The, the hypo, there's a hypocrisy in wanting to further education and to improve education and keeping religious schools open. And I read recently in the paper that this, I think it's the city, I'm not sure. <laughs> it was in the Times that was try, it wants to encourage uh, keeping all religious schools open uh, as a way of furthering better education. However, we pretend that the religious schools are enlightened. But the very okay, right, you're right, giving I'm a done, talk. I'm done. The very foundation of their thinking is antithetical to reason as well as to real equality amongst all people. Okay, so, I'm going to have to stop you there. Yeah. You know, things are not that simple. You know, it was in the patriarchal church that I first was told that I had something meaningful to say. And I read the scripture every Sunday from the time I was 10 till I was 18. And one of the things I will share with you about life, all of you, life isn't that simple black and white. That in, the, in, in many situations of oppression and um, negative thinking, especially in religious circles, people have also found a way to hold on. I mean, I, you know, James Cleveland, black gospel singer, you know, wrote a little song called Lord Help Me to Hold On. And that's all he keeps repeating, like, Lord, help me to hold on. Think about liberation theology for black people. So I don't think we can make blanket statements about religious schools and what goes on, um, especially since I teach at a Christian college. Um, <laughs> but I think we have to recognize that dismantling something or going against it, if we don't really know the whole story, doesn't really help us. And we have to... We have to work. I mean, education is a central place that is in dire need of revolutionary change on all fronts, not just in religious schools. Your question, good to see you. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Agate Tefessa, and I want to say first thank you for being here. It's always such a gift. Um, and my question, I'm actually kind of rethinking it, but I, um, so I've been, a, I've been involved in a lot of protest and um, direct action in the last six months. Okay, or, what or nine I, I'm or so. failing oh. as a pedagogue. Okay. I, I, I no. told no, everybody to be quick. Okay, and okay. they're not. Quick. Okay. I'm being quick. Okay. So I, and I hate it. I hate protesting. I think it's, it, it spiritually drains me. It makes me very exhausted. It's terrible. And my question, what, but I think it's necessary and important. And my question is one, like, how. How do you stay spiritual, spiritually healthy when you're conducting and doing that work? Because I think it's necessary and we can't okay, stop. Okay, thank and you, also, thank you. I love you. <laughs> you feel... <laughs> um, I go to a progressive black church, um, Light of the World in Sarasota, Florida, and I have... I've been troubled a lot. I'm at a transition moment in my life, and I have pastoral counseling every Tuesday um, where I talk with my pastor over things that deeply concern me or just things that I'm reflecting on. I'm trying to write more about spirituality so that I think that partially you have to find what is that spiritual place for you. Like for some people, it's meditating. You know, bell hooks need serious help. I meditate, I read my Bible, I read my inspiration. I mean, this is every morning. I have to, I have to give my, it's like the double dose of my baby's love. I have to get it all in order to, if I'm troubled, to, to stand strong. Um, and I think that everybody has to decide what that is gonna be for them. It could be communing with nature. It could be, what am I giving? I think that gratitude and giving, my sister and I practice gratitude every day. We try to go over our day and ask ourselves, what are we giving? Because giving will make you feel better too, especially for those of us, I mean, I, I don't talk about depression so much as I call, have life-threatening melancholy. <laughs> Doesn't that sound much more poetic than depression? But anyway, to deal with life-threatening melancholy, I think also what opera singers and other people know is that it's impossible to stay deeply depressed if you sing. Yes. And so singing yes. 
Yes. Oh, are you going to sing that song that we're hearing so much about? Oh, no, not tonight. Okay. <laughs> See? Unless you want me to. Yes, I do. <laughs> oh. Well, first let's... We didn't know you could sing. I didn't know either. Well, let's hear it. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> You're kidding. Yeah, all right. Is this a little song that I used to sing for Chiara and Dante when they were little because talking, reading, singing to your child promotes attachment and the more words they hear the better and it was, this was a nice little sing-songy thing that I, had, I enjoyed singing. I think it made all those positive hormones, hormones come out of my body and everything and, and um, my name is Mommy and what is yours? I want to know, who are you? Kiara, Kiara, that's a nice name. And that's the way we play our game. See? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this today. Nothing beats the experiential. Like hearing that song. Mm. I mean, how many of us, people of color, heard any kind of song sung to us as a child for comfort, for self esteem? And I don't think that raise we. Raise your hands, raise your hands. Talked enough yeah. about yeah. self esteem. Mm -hmm. I mean, that wasn't a lot of people. No, not enough. Not Your enough. Name? Uh -huh. Hi, good evening. My name is Genevieve DeBose, and I'm a proud seventh grade English teacher here in New York City in the Bronx. <laughs> This is, a really, this is a really nice way to end the school week, so thank you. Um, and my, I'm always exposing my students to my favorite literature and books that had an impact on me. So Black, Richard Wright's Black Boy, Sandra Cisneros, the work of authors that really moved me. And I wanted to ask both of you, what books would you recommend for my seventh grade students that either had an impact on you when you were in middle school or um, that you would recommend to them? That's so hard because, you know, when you say start where people are, I'd have to know something about them and where they are. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you the that... The Watsons go to Birmingham. Yeah. Yep. You know that book? Yeah. yeah. I like that. That's a good For one. For small right? children, yes. I really yes. like Leo the Late Bloomer. Yeah. Yes. Um, and in, for me... Seventh grade, though. Louisa seventh. May Alcott yeah. was yeah. the big, you know, I still cry for Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, but also Joe's struggle to be, accept her solitude, to be who she is, was very important to me. Um, a Girl Called Destiny. Okay. I don't remember the author. Okay. So that's but, just a couple. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Be sure you read those Bell Hooks books, because. I know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> of course. No, but I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. no, I mean. I'm going to reread some and pull out excerpts for my kids. Happy to be happy. No, but I mean, like, seventh graders can deconstruct those books as to, like, yes. what's going on in them. Yes. B-Boy Buzz. Yes. Um, the eye, the ear, I didn't the write nose. them yes. just for children. <laughs> and I tell you, I get a lot of letters from adults that read those books. Your name? Thank you. Etisha Brown. Um, I'm organizing a black love festival in San Francisco. Um, there's 3% of San black people left in San Francisco because of the rapid gentrification due to the STEM boom. Um, so I'm like fighting for my people. I've been organizing actions and protests and things like that, but I'm, tr I'm getting to it. Um, so my point is that, um, so beyond protests and beyond like um, events or things that are reactionary, like the Black Lives Matter hashtag, what are ways that um, communities can create tangible ways to heal long-term um, beyond those reactionary um, things? Teach skills. I mean, I, I think it's good to like, get people together and like figure out like how to teach people to do things like meditate or... Um, I think of a book, Alters in the Street. All which is about street. Oakland and changing neighborhoods and mm -hmm. what people do together. So, your Present. name? Oops. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Olivia. I was just wondering, um, with the new pre-K and outreach, like after-school outreach program, if you will be including media literacy and emotional literacy education to, to try and mend the broken system that we have? Certainly um, emotional literacy. I call it social-emotional teaching now, and absolutely, it's part, of the, it's part of the curriculum. 
I just didn't hear the, about it in mm -hmm. the newspaper. Well, you know, so, guess yeah. what? We couldn't cover everything. <laughs> no, no, well, I'm talking about the media couldn't, yeah. but I just yeah. wanted to know. Thank you. I have to model. You see, I'm an old pro. I'm two years older than her. So I have to model how you, like, be a good pedagogue and keep people from, you know, taking over. Your name? Hi, I'm Karina Sharif. Um, I'm wondering if you both have suggestions about, I think that one of the, a big problem for our mental health system is that there isn't really a place to really express your anger, especially for black men. We see that there's so many black men in prisons. Um, and it seems like our society gets very terrified when a black man gets angry. I'm wondering if there's any, if you guys have any ideas of how we could actually create a tangible place for black men and also people of the global majority people of color to actually, I think it's healing to express your anger and actually have physical sessions or what, what that could look like and if that seems like something that's a possibility. I'm not sure that I think it's healing to express your anger, but that's because a lot of the spiritual teachers that I work with don't think uh, it's different to own your anger. And it's another thing to, because expressing it in and of itself may not bring about the change you desire. It simply may fuel more anger or a heart attack or you're hurting somebody. Mm -hmm. So the question is, I mean, I remember when I had experienced a lot of racism and was having trouble with the boyfriend when I first went to see Thich Nhat Hanh. And I was like so moved that I was gonna meet the spiritual teacher of my dreams. And you know, when I met him, I just started to cry and I was yelling, I am so angry, I'm angry at racism, I'm angry at patriarchy. And you know, if you know Thich Nhat Hanh, he was like, hold on to your anger and use it as compost for your garden. And I was like, oh, I can do that. I can hold on to my anger and use it as compost for your garden. But, but think about the fact that he gave me a practical thing to think about and a practical metaphor. Mm -hmm. What if I don't try to get rid of my anger, but what if I think about how can I recycle this anger? What can I do with it? I like that. Um, I like and I that. think that as yeah. far as, you know, I do mm -hmm. a lot of stuff in my house because I follow the Bethune Cookman model. Do it in your living room. We don't have to institutionalize everything. Everything does not have to bring money. You can be, bring folk into your living room to sit and talk, you know? People here can testify to Cornell coming and sitting in my living room and not answering our questions when they were hard questions, but he came and he sat and he gave us the love. And so there's a lot we can do where we are. Just remember that, start where you are. What can you do where you are in your community? I'm really into the local stuff, food banks, all of those kinds of things. Your question, sir? I'd say it's important that the oh, anger sorry, not become self-destructive, too. You know, if it doesn't get... If it implodes, yeah. Right, if it doesn't get recycled, if it doesn't get channeled into something constructive, productive, then it loops back, and that is, that's the worst. Thank you. Your name? Hi, my name is Buddy. Good afternoon. Um, so, mental health and racism. I think you know racism is a, is a disease, and I think of it also. I wonder why it's not often talked about as um, a mental illness. And I, I, I was just wondering what the two of you thought about that, like why it's not discussed as that, and and the possibility, short of having to continue to coddle racists, um, the possibility of that being something that might come to pass eventually. And I brought you two flowers, um, but your husband came, so I'm gonna leave them with him, if that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, come on. We already know that the person that controls um, the narrative tells the story. Of course white people aren't gonna say they are crazy. Um, <laughs> Of course they're not gonna say white supremacy is insane. Um, I think the important thing, because I believe, I don't know, I didn't talk with Sherlane about this, every single one of us in this room has been affected by white supremacy, which is why I often choose that over racism. Every single person in this room, there's something about our lives, about who we connect with, about who we love, everything about our choices. And that's where our power lies, is in unlearning white supremacy. And of course, we can't unlearn it 
if we're not willing to face it and to call it out for the sickness that it is. Like I'm getting ready to call out Barry. Barry's my white male assistant, um, and he's done a lot of unlearning racism. Uh, what do you think, Barry, is a key to a white, a, a, you know, a well-off white man? Um, you got any words of wisdom? I, I actually think and don't I'll, be long. I will be very short. <laughs> I'll be very short. I, honestly, I think that the, the, the key first is to say, I'm a racist, right? And to admit that to yourself, and then to figure out how am I going to struggle with that every single day until I get to the point where I realize I've dealt with enough of it to begin to accept that I'm progressing in my life, I'm including people in my life that are not just white. Okay. But uh, now, I, I, of course, again, failed as a teacher because I would have liked Barry to say, instead of racist, white supremacist. Um, be, oh, <laughs> because I think that we all have to look at ourselves, what we desire. Um, you know, I had to work on my dislike of blonde people. I'm not lying. Like, um, and especially blonde white women. You know, I mean, you have to look at those areas of your life and ask, where is this prejudice coming from? Where is this hostility coming from? And let's face it, white women in America have a lot of hatred for us as black women. Are they asking themselves, like, where is that coming from? You know, I mean, I had to go to a white woman doctor. She treated me so bad, I took Barry's sister with me, and she was shocked by how I was treated. But I, was, I really wanted to interview this person and say, well, what happened? Why do you have this level of hatred towards a black female that you don't even know that has come to you seeking healing? Because I think we carry this stuff without even knowing that we're carrying it. You know, your name? Hi, my name's Keisha. Um, I'm a seminary student. Um, and my question is, how can we reimagine spiritual spaces in the church, should we at all? Um, and what's our responsibility as people of faith who watch this trauma sort of perpetuated through the church? Well, I think that we have to look for what churches offer us healing. I mean, it's no simple thing. Looking for a church, if you're looking for one, is like looking for a good therapist. It's hard to find a church that has the principles and the values I find within myself. My church that I go to, Light of the World, is a traditional black church. At one point I thought, you know, Pastor, the homophobia here is such that I can't be coming here. And he made a big change, and it was a big change in our congregation. And I think that then the all-white church I go to where I live in the all-white town pretty much um, has incredible progressive politics. And can we get a sense of the sacred? Um, it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, we do all the right things in mission work and in anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobia. But, you know, so it's like one of the things I think is, okay, uh, we got a little time here. I am a big fan of this book by Buddhist psychoanalysis analyst uh, David Rico, which is the five things we cannot change. People are not always loyal and loving. Life isn't fair, everything changes and ends, pain is a part of life, things don't go according to plan. And he says most people are in therapy because of their inability to accept one or more of the four things. You know, I had to go to therapy because I couldn't accept any of the five things. <laughs> I didn't want anything to change and end. I didn't want anybody to be unloving. So I mean, I think we have to search and search vigilantly for those spaces where we find c comfort and solace. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge for me to go to the light of the world at times where I'm not challenged at Union where I go, where I live part of the time. And it's that constant searching. And I think that we have to talk about there is joy and struggle. I mean, one thing that is hard to convey in words to people, is when you get healed, it's such a joy. You know, when you get your healing, mm -hmm. when you come into your loving, it's such a powerful thing. 
But I've found that it's, it's, it's like AA for people. It's hard to tell people, you know, what it's like, the, the sense of power you feel in your life when you are exercising healthy self-esteem. And we didn't talk enough about the development of self-esteem because I think at one point with the patriarchal black power movement, there was a kind of poo-pooing of, of self-esteem, like that's a little soft issue, let's get our guns, um, <laughs> things like that. And, as it, and yet, you know, so many of us are wounded in that place where we would know love. We're, I would like us to think about schools of love. How do we develop self-esteem? Um, and, you know, self-esteem isn't feeling good about yourself. It's feeling self-efficacy. I can have power over my world and change and accountability and responsibility. And I think for many of us, I really believe we see kids who are learning that. You know, people try to tell me everybody's dysfunctional. It's not so. If you look at families where children are loved, it's not that they don't suffer. It's not that they don't have mental health problems sometimes. But being loved allows you to have the strength to deal with your problems, to handle them, to go where you need to go, to reach out to who you need to reach out to. And that's more important than some fantasy world where we think we're going to be without pain. Your question? You're writing a lot over there. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing down everything you're saying. Um, so my name is Ola, and it's a blessing to hear you both. Um, and I just have a quick question. Um, Megan Hockaday, Tanisha Anderson, Natasha McKenna, these are just a few of the black women that have been killed by police because their loved ones called 911 when they were in crisis. Whether it be because of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So do you think it's possible for us to set up alternative systems so that we don't have to call 911 when our loved ones are in crisis and if so, what would that look like? I think that that's a really difficult question because it it's a very, I mean, I, because I live in a small town, I really celebrate the local and the politics of the local. And that's true of any community in New York, but people have to be willing to organize and to stand together. I mean, one of the things I noticed in watching the footage of the mother in Baltimore, do you notice how many people weren't even paying attention? that nobody intervened, that nobody said, stop the violence uh, here, what can we do? It was just like they were in a world by themselves. And I think that that's often how we respond as a culture to a familial violence, to domestic violence. And so that organizational thing has to be on a local level so that people have key people you can call. I mean, it used to be that we called our pastors, but you know when the pastors are fornicating and being violent and being predators, it's pretty hard to call on them. And so we have to, what did I say that was wrong? <laughs> um, so that I think we have to hope for that new breed of men uh, who and are- women. And, and women who are embracing, but men especially who talk to other men. Men have not mm -hmm. been very open in the domestic violence world. I just did a marvelous program uh, I thought it was so brilliant uh, <laughs> with the black woman, Beth Ritchie, that the NFL hired to deal with um, domestic violence. Yes. Um, and we did a program together a couple of weeks ago. And the level of care and compassion and our, our, our love for our black men and other groups of men that are violent themselves and that have been wounded by violence. And how, to, I mean, I think that that's a big step for the NFL to take, mm -hmm. to just even publicly acknowledge that domestic violence is a widespread problem. But we have also, raise the question, is it possible to be an athlete in this culture um, where we treat a game like war and not be violent? And, and until we, have, we- Can we have any all-male institution and not have violence and war? All Come right. on. All right. Right, can we? We need more, we need to balance things out. We can't have a police force that's all-male. We can't have a fire department. We can't have any of our institutions be all male and there not be an imbalance. But we can also not have a culture where people are committed to domination. I want to say my last little pitch, which is I'm deeply 
concerned, as is Charlene, about children and the level of violence against children in our society. Because one of the things we're teaching children is violence is the way you can solve your problems. Um, not emotional awareness, not emotional discussion, and or feeling, expression of feeling. And I think until that changes, it won't matter how mixed our groups are because women will assume the same kind of patriarchal, patriarchy has no gender. And other forms of domination don't either. And so until we really look, take our children seriously, what are we teaching them? What are we teaching them about love? Your name? Hi, uh, my name is Sasha Washington. Excuse my voice. Um, I'm advocating and with working with AVP, Anti-Violence Project. My question is, how can we have a conversation about healing with our trans women of color? And I'm um, very proud to be trans. Um, trans women of color, that the current rate of death, sorry. The current rate of death within this year, eight alone within the first two months of this year. How can we have a conversation with that? Charlene, do you have a response? Can you say the last part of that question again, please? <clears throat> Sorry. It's okay, take your time. I'm a very proud woman trans of color, mm -hmm. and I'm here to advocate for my transgender community of color. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how can we start or built a conversation in our trans community of healing with our trans community with the death rates, the rates of death, this year alone, the first two years, eight death. Well, I think you're doing it already just by speaking out. Makes, starting a public conversation is so important. Um, you had you you Laverne Cox here. You know, one of the things that I, I tend to, to shy away from it sometimes is that I believe so deeply that the issue is domination and domination is kept and contained by violence. So that I don't see the violence against trans people as isolated from the domestic violence in heteronormative situations that is killing women and children every day. So I don't want us to separate out the violences because the more we separate them out, the more we see, make it seem like a certain form of violence is unique. When these violences are not unique to imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, I'm sure more trans people are being murdered and slaughtered in this country every day than we will ever know. Um, in the same with the women and children who are dying every day that we won't know. But the question is, how do we begin to re-educate ourselves to end violence? Because I just don't believe we can end the violence against trans folks, but keep the violence against everyday heteronormative black folks. Um, I mean, the fact is, we are living in a time of great warfare. And many of us, as people of color, no matter our sexual practice, our beings, our the enemy. I mean, for the first time in my life, I was pulled over a couple of weeks ago. I was so mad with the white women I was with by the police. And I was mad at them because they wouldn't take a video. But um, <laughs> the thing that really saddened me at 62 years old, that's the first time in my life that I have ever been afraid of the police, that I have always felt that I could talk with the police, that there could be some level of understanding. And it really made me, because remember, I live in Mayberry. Um, what has changed so radically in our nation that as black people, as people of color especially, we all have to fear police brutality. We all have to fear that the police are not willing to listen to us. And I don't just mean the white police, I mean the police, <laughs> you know, that are not willing to hear us. So to me, it seems like part of what we have to have in our nation is the kind of civil rights movement against violence that will make it possible for all of us to be safe, to have optimal well-being. I would like to close my own comments by saying, well, I got that um, 
One of my favorite books is by a black male psychiatrist, Norman Anderson, and it's called Emotional Longevity. And in that book, he tells us what is needed in order to have a life of optimal well-being. And just as I gave my ex those cards, I carry the ingredients that he says are needed for me to have optimal well-being in my life so that I can ask myself, what am I doing on behalf of my own self-care, my health, um, to live the life that I want to lead? And I think we have to do, we have to know what those things are, and we have to do what we can. And while poverty is a grave issue, I don't want us to assume that because the poor have to be uh, violent, the poor have to be all of these ugly things that the rest of us with material comfort don't feel like we necessarily have to deal with. Poverty should not be something that we are ashamed of. Poverty is, should not be something that we can't talk about. What are the conditions? I mean, let me tell you, when you live in Appalachia, you can come and see people living like it could be Haiti, it could be any war zone in the world. Because our world is really destroyed a lot by coal, by fracking, and the thing is, it's not that people can't have lives of well-being and be poor. It's like, what are the conditions necessary? Well, one of those conditions is your water can't be contaminated. You can't have sludge. Environmental issues are crucial to us having lives of well-being. And so I encourage you to see the documentary of Fierce Green Fire, which shows us how black people and people of color have been from the beginning involved in the environmental movement. Do you have a last comment yeah, you want to say? I think it all comes back to love. I mean, it sounds yes. like a catch-22 situation, right? Because you talk about um, you live in a situation where you can't have love because of all the things that are stressing you out, but it still comes back to you've got to have it. You've got to love yourself. You've got to love yourself in order to be able to love others. If you have pain, you have hurt, you've got to reach out and talk to people. Find somebody you can trust to help get you out of that hole that you're in. Or, and that makes everything else possible. That's well, your see, foundation. I, I hope, Shirlane, that we live to see the day where we will read the books and the testimony of single mothers in poverty who have raised loving children, who love in the face of the circumstances that they live within. Because as long as we keep this notion that to be poor is to always be dehumanized and unloving, we, cr we create the conditions that further the damaging of poor children, of women and children. I want to end with this statement. If you have love, you have the community of belonging that comes with it. We want to thank Sherlane and her community of belonging. Uh, Bill is having his birthday today. Um, We celebrate him, we celebrate his love of Sherlane, we celebrate his love of Dante, and we just celebrate his love of New York City. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, New School. Thank you, New School. Thank you, Sherlane. Thank you, Belle.